Hi, I'm David Cooper. I'm currently the director of global mental health here at Teladoc. And I'm here to tell you about how Teladoc is leading the way in the global rollout of our mental health tools. I've been working in digital mental health for the past decade, helping the U.S. government and many of the top health systems in the U.S. design and implement their digital health strategy. Today at Teladoc, I'm helping our teams roll out our digital mental health tools to an international audience. The past few years have highlighted the increased attention that we all need to bring to our mental health, not only for those of us in the United States, but on a global scale as well. But first, I just want to give you an introduction to Teladoc International. We're currently in over 17 countries, work with over 5,000 providers, and to date, have had over 18 million patient visits. We're a big group looking to tackle an ambitious problem. Namely, how do we address the challenge of providing great mental health care on a global scale? But let's start by talking about the overall challenges in global mental health right now. I know many of you are likely familiar with the increasing challenges for receiving mental health care here in the U.S. More people want care at a time where care seems harder to get than ever before. Some people can take up to six months before you get your first appointment with a therapist. But when we look globally, the problem is even worse. According to the World Health Organization, over 260 million people are affected annually by depression around the globe. That's not to mention things like anxiety, PTSD, or the host of other mental issues that we can all face at one time or another. Similar to what we see in the U.S., there's also a shortage of mental health workers. In high-income countries, this could look like having only 25 mental health workers for every 100,000 people. In lower-income countries, this number falls to only two for every 100,000 people. So at Teladoc, we're thinking hard about how to address this challenge, knowing that we can't simply throw people at the problem. There's far too many people in need of mental health services, and we simply can't turn out therapists fast enough. So how do we design a system that works? How do we design a system that provides people with a range of options, giving some the face-to-face -face care that they need and giving others maybe just a simple nudge in the right direction to help them over a temporary setback? We're looking at how we might address these systemic global needs while still tackling cultural stigma differences in how we talk and approach mental health. This can not only be language, but also addressing how other countries talk about mental health and what role it plays in their overall society and daily life. In addition to the global need and overall lack of providers seen in the U.S., another challenge is how the healthcare system operates in other countries compared to how it does here. The U.S. market is incredibly unique. Often, digital health companies go after employers and payers simply because that's where the most money can be found. Also, in government and individual consumers are all legitimate markets in the U.S. Each of these have their own unique needs and challenges for companies trying to tackle that particular market. Overseas, some of these markets change or disappear. For example, business models can be more tightly defined and often government reimbursement is the biggest customer. And when working with governments, for those of you in the U.S. who've had experience in digital health, you can think about it like implementing a solution with a payer and a hospital system at the same time. One where you have to tackle both the challenges of cost savings and the challenges of integration all together. And when it comes to employers, companies are frequently global in their scope and global companies need global offerings. They need solutions that can work wherever a person finds themselves. But it's not all bad news. Despite the size of the need and challenges of adapting to new business models, the good news is that for mental health, you can count on the basics being pretty much the same, as long as you do the necessary cultural adaptation, of course. For example, the basic efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, has already been replicated in various cultures around the world, so that we know many of the underpinning elements are still valid. Knowing that we can rely on the basics, that how we think and act can influence our emotions and vice versa gives us a solid platform to build from when we start looking at other elements of cultural adaptation ethics or unique cultural beliefs 
And the good news there is that a lot of that research has already been done. The body of telehealth research already has a wealth of information on ethical considerations and using technology and providing health care, cultural considerations with different populations, ranging from ethnicity to socioeconomic status. They've really done a lot of the base research for us that we can really adapt to our own products in digital health. Also, from a product standpoint, thinking about the international market is really just about considering the needs of any new market, just like you would any place else. You can't simply copy and paste what you have into Google Translate and expect success. Take, for example, how we handle crisis response here in the U.S. We know that when a patient is in crisis, we have pretty prescribed ways of dealing with them and ethical considerations as therapists on what our role is and what our duty to act. But overseas, for example, that threshold to act could be much higher, and there could be much more that we need to do to ensure a patient is safe when they're in crisis. Similarly, content topics that we're free to discuss here in the U.S., like opiate use or tobacco, can be more prohibited overseas. And so you really have to understand how to provide that same level of care without running afoul of regulations or overstepping your bounds. So given the need, the challenges, the scope, we wanted to know how could we bring our successful products here from the U.S. to the rest of the world, starting with my strength. Again, my strength is something we know works in the U.S. For those of you who maybe aren't familiar with my strength, let me give you a quick overview. It really involves three different levels. The first level is our digital programs. That contains all of our structured digital content and digital programs evidence-backed content that's there to give you practical tips on how to handle the current stressors that you might be facing. It's really there for a self-service guide that you know that you can rely on. For those who might need a little bit more help, however, our next level is our coaching. That's where we have real live coaches to help listen, understand the problems that you're going through, and help point you to the right sources in those digital programs that could be most beneficial to you. And finally, we have digital therapy and digital psychiatry, solutions for those who really need a lot more care and are maybe having a lot harder time dealing with the challenges that they're facing. From our research, we've seen an over 50% reduction in depression scores and we know it's just as effective as face-to-face -face therapy. So then our question naturally was, which countries should we target first? For us, Canada and the UK were easy choices. Reducing one element like the language barrier made it easy to focus on other things like data needs, regulatory issues, and other general cultural adaptations we'd have to make to our content to take it to a more global audience. It also made it easier for us to look at how do we address different regulations in different markets. As you look at taking your product overseas, you're going to run into all kinds of different regulations. Take GDPR, for example. You might know it as the annoying cookie pop-up that we all have to deal with now whenever we visit a website. But really, it's focused on data and privacy and how that's handled in the EU. You also have things like CE Mark or DIGA in Germany, all processes and things that we don't have in the US. And that may require different levels of evidence or technical needs that we're simply not used to. So it's important to reduce the overall variables you have to tackle. This is why we focused on Canada and the UK so that we could handle these other issues. Also, how did we address all those cultural differences? As I said, it's not just about language. Again, copy and paste from Google Translate, not gonna work. It's a lot of nuance and could be how you talk about things or even how fast you talk about them. A good example from my past is when I worked in the DOD, we worked with the VA to develop an application called PTSD Coach. It was really very successful and we had people from around the world wanting to adapt it to their own local populations. So we got all kinds of interesting questions. One that stands out is, Hey, can we re-record this at a lower speed? Because you Americans simply talk too fast. It wasn't about the content or what we were saying. It was simply the speed at which we were addressing it. But that's just one example of the kinds of cultural adaptations that you're going to find. 
things beyond just simply translating a word from one language to another. So as I said, we've launched My Strength internationally in Canada and the UK. And so today, I want to focus on the UK as our most recent product launch of My Strength, tell you a little bit about the need in the UK and the lessons that we learned from launching in the UK. Mental health concerns represent a considerable impact on the workforce and economy in the UK. Mental health conditions exist on a spectrum of levels, ranging from people who are maybe just experiencing a particularly stressful time, all the way to people who need a lot more help and deal with mental health issues on a more chronic basis and need a little bit more help as they face challenges. We know that one in five adults in the UK will be diagnosed with a mental health need at that clinical level each year. And of those, at least half will have either a co-occurring substance use disorder or some other long-term physical condition. About half of all the costs in the UK that are driven by mental health conditions are indirect, mostly because of these co-occurring conditions. Someone with a substance abuse disorder who is also struggling with mental health issues may see things like keeping and retaining employment or may need housing needs. Because we know that from depression alone, the UK suffers a significant loss every year of about £8 billion annually in lost productivity and in other social costs. The National Health Service in England is constantly striving to address these mental health concerns, but we also know it isn't working as well as it should. Over half of UK residents live in areas where there's really little to no access to psychiatric care, and they have an average of 10 weeks wait time for specialty psychological care. The truth is, many just aren't getting the help that they need. Add on to that, individual challenges like the stigma in seeking mental health care, the complexity of life that comes with dealing with a mental health issue, and many find it's just difficult to understand the various options of care to be able to get access to care when they need it most. So those are really the things we targeted here at Teladoc when we thought about rolling out the My Strength program to the UK. How do we address those access challenges? How do we design a product that helps people overcome the challenges of stigma and perception of mental health, lower barriers to entry like costs and being able to find a provider and drive there? I know for me as an American, when I visited the UK, one of the most challenging things was figuring out British roads, so I can certainly understand the transportation challenges. But again, we want to make it clear to people what their options are and give them easy access to the right care that they need right now. And in the UK, we're not only looking to address the needs of the National Health Service, but UK employers as well. Our pitch to UK employers is that addressing their employees' mental health pays off in the end. We know it costs them about £45 billion a year, and we know that for every one pound they spend on supporting their employees' mental health, they're going to get five pounds back in reduced absenteeism, staff turnover, and overall mental well being of their employees. And so, with My Strength, they can provide that early intervention to increase that return on investment and for the employee to get them mental health care as quickly as they can when they need it. So we work with them on an organization-wide cultural change and education for their staff to help them understand how My Strength can help them and when it's appropriate to seek help. And that approach has led to some really great success. As we rolled out My Strength across the UK, within three months of launch, we were able to get a contract with the NHS to cover up to four regions and make my strength available to over 1.4 million Britons living in the UK. What they were impressed with was how we were able to reduce the load on their hospitals and GPs, who, like primary care providers in the US, have been really the front line of mental health during this pandemic. And so by adding this adjunctive service, we can take some of the burden off of them and help mitigate the strain of those long waiting lists caused by the COVID pandemic and overall lack of providers within the UK 
to help those with mental health issues in need. And if I have to give you some personal lessons learned, I'd say that first, make sure that you involve clinical experts in that country as early as you can. It can be a real challenge as to how to address cultural, clinical, and regulatory issues without specialized experience. For us, we had a great team of clinicians we worked with at Teladoc UK to be able to adapt our content based on these new clinical and cultural requirements. So if I can take a moment, I want to say a special thank you to both Karen and Laura for their help. Second, make sure that you know what the regulatory requirements are up front, including the kinds of evidence you'd need in order to launch your product into a new country. And third, know what market needs are going to be from buyers. What kind of special regulatory certifications or technical requirements will be necessary in order to win in that particular country? As you can see, there's a lot that's involved in taking a U.S. developed mental health product to a global audience. We've really only scratched the surface here. Of course, none of this would have been possible without our team of hundreds of designers, developers, product managers, marketers, clinicians, everyone who has worked so hard to adapt our product to a global market. It takes both time and a team to make something like this successful. And we're looking forward to the next country to expand our products and help further address the many needs in global mental health. And so to wrap up, I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I'd especially like to thank Salome for having us again and organizing another great year of this conference. If you have any further questions, please reach out to me via email or at the conference. I'd love to help however I can.